All right. Well, thank you very much indeed for this opportunity to talk about my book, Islam and Law in Lebanon, Sharia Within and Without the State. Uh, so as the title suggests, this is a book about the relationship between Sharia or Islamic law um, and state law in Lebanon. Um, and that's a complicated and at, uh, at some points controversial relationship because Lebanon isn't um, uh, in any sense a, a Muslim or Islamic country, although it has very many Muslim citizens. Um, but uh, Lebanon is rather a multi, a plural, a plural state, uh, a multi-confessional state where power uh, is shared between different religious communities uh, and respect is shown to those communities in part through respect for their religious law uh, in the domain of family law. Um, and so whether or not you are a, a religious person uh, for matters of uh, marriage, divorce uh, and so on, uh, you are subject to religious law in different religious courts for the 18 different um, official religious communities of Lebanon. Um, so in part then, this is a book about Muslim family law uh, in Lebanon and how it works in practice. There are actually five different uh, Muslim communities in Lebanon or official Muslim communities, the Sunni, the Twelver Shi'i, the Alawi, the Druze and the Ismaili communities. Uh, my book really concentrates on the Sunni and the Twelver Shi'i communities, which are the biggest ones of those. Um, and part of what I did was sit in the Sharia courts, the Sunni Sharia courts and the Jafari or Twelver Shi'i uh, Sharia courts, uh, which are family law courts for members of those communities, to see how that law works in practice. But another very important part of what the book is about is about the fact that Sharia is more than uh, family law. Uh, Sharia is more than just law indeed. Sharia could be seen as a whole way of life and its rules cover personal ethics as much as they do law. Um, and religious scholars, um, Islamic religious scholars who study the law, uh, write about many different things uh, beyond family law. And so the book uh, is also about the relationship between the world of the Sharia applied as family law within the state-backed uh, courts, and then this wider world of um, intellectual debate. Uh, uh, and Lebanon is a very is a site of very lively uh, Islamic intellectual debate. Now, I wanted to write the book for for many reasons. Um, my relationship with Lebanon goes back to my time as a doctoral student, and I wrote my uh, thesis and first book about Islamic medical ethics. Um, and I did that in Lebanon because there was such a range of different um, opinion there with the Sunni and uh, Twelver Shi'i communities. Uh, and I met many very interesting uh, Islamic scholars, uh, but I became aware of this relationship between Sharia um, as uh, personal ethics, medical ethics, uh, a world of intellectual debate, but also its place within uh, everyday life as part of the Lebanese state. And uh, the complexities of that relationship, which I felt raised very interesting and important questions uh, about the nature of Sharia in our modern plural world. Um, and um, I mean, certainly in my earlier work, but also in this work, I hope to challenge uh, some prevailing preconceptions of Sharia, but also contribute to the academic debates about um, Sharia and its relationship with law. Um, and I'd also come to know uh, many people in Lebanon uh, and uh, wanted uh, you know, to write this book uh, in part for them. It took me quite a long time to finish it, for which I apologise, but I'm very happy to have been able um, uh, to do that and that it's now been published. So, um, because a large part of what I want to do is to show uh, the relationship between Sharia as practiced in the family law courts and the world of Sharia outside of the courts. The book has two big parts, one about the courts and then one about um, the life of the Sharia outside of the courts. I start, though, with some background on, first of all, the political situation when I carried out my fieldwork in 2007 and 2008, which was very difficult. 
Uh, and so was the economic situation, which has got still worse uh, since. Uh, but I also talk about the legal background, um, the complex system of laws that govern the place of uh, the Sharia uh, in Lebanese legal life. Uh, but I also want to tell you something about um, the background to those people who work uh, within the courts, people for whom the Sharia is a vocation. Uh, they've made it the center of their lives by becoming an alim, uh, a scholar qualified in the law. Um, and I, I start the book by thinking about what people expect of someone like that. And I do that by writing about uh, a young scholar I know at the beginning of his career um, who uh, was imam in a mosque, um, but who also gave lessons and sermons to people in the mosque. And um, I was very struck by his enormous commitment to his role. It took up you know, his entire life. Uh, and um, the affection that members of the community had for him, but the importance then for someone being a sheikh, being an alim, a scholar, is also about helping people, engaging with people, and also teaching people. Tremendous obligation to impart your knowledge uh, to others if you're someone that has undertaken Islamic learning as your career. And those are very important themes through the rest of the book. So then uh, I think about um, the place of Sharia within the state in the Lebanese uh, Sharia courts, the Sunni courts and the Jafari courts. And so I start by sort of introducing how the courts work. Um, and something that is very important uh, to my account is a certain sort of duality to the courts. On the one hand, they're a place where, as a sheikh, as somebody who's trained in the religious sciences, you can work as a judge um, and you wear your religious robes. Uh, so if you go to the court, you see the, the sheikhs in their religious robes and it looks very religious. Uh, but in terms of its um, atmosphere and its business, it's actually um, a bureaucratic office um, and uh, it's part of the bureaucratic life of the state. Um, and so there's a little bit of a tension between um, the court as a place of Sharia, God's divine law, but also a place of state administration or state law, Qanun. And so the way the, way the judges talk about it is a tension between a Shara uh, and Qanun. Um, and also within the courts are lawyers who are trained in the civil law. Uh, and a lot of the court's business is bound up with civil law. Uh, proper procedure, how um, a case should properly, properly be constructed, uh, the proper uh, processes of notifying uh, people that a case has been brought against them and so on. Um, and so there is a tension there, this assemblage between um, a Sharia institution, but also a state legal bureaucratic institution. And then I try and show that how that tension works out um, uh, in, in the subsequent chapters, for example, through marriage, because, of course, you can be married uh, in God's eyes uh, if you uh, have a Sharia contract of marriage uh, uh, without registering that with the state. But uh, the state wants you to register that marriage, so you will be read, your marriage will be registered in law as well as uh, having been uh, solemnized before God. But you could do your um, your uh, marriage contract with a sheikh without registering it with the state, so you'd be married before God but not before the state. Or indeed you could, uh, if you were one of the many millions of Lebanese who live outside Lebanon, for in Europe for example, you could have a uh, state civil marriage but not have had a religious marriage. So there is a duality uh, in the very institutions of marriage uh, and also divorce. Um, and then as the book progresses, I talk about uh, the legal disputes that come before the Sharia courts, uh, the very sad cases of marriage breakdown, often because of the very difficult economic situation um, and the ways in which most often women uh, try to find redress against uh, their husbands, um, which is difficult. 
Um, and the law is structured in slightly different ways in the Sunni courts and the Jaffrey court systems as I explore, but I show how uh, you can build towards a case of uh, divorce um, as a woman, a judicial divorce, and all the different bits of evidence that that requires and, and the complicated legal process. And people, uh, as well as the judges, complain that a lot of this feels very bureaucratic um, and so the judges will say that, that, well, this is because this is all of that state kanun. This isn't, um, this isn't what the ideal Sharia would look like, all of this frustrating bureaucracy. Um, so the people's experiences of the Sharia courts is often um, uncomfortable uh, and uh, difficult. Uh, and it's a difficult role then for the judge, who on the one hand is a sheikh, and as I said at the beginning of the book, there's an expectation that he should be somebody lovely and helpful um, who will um, tell you about, um, you know, all those good things uh, uh, that religion uh, has and the Sharia should offer, God's law. Uh, but on the other hand, he's got to do all of that boring paperwork and uh, send you away for another month because... Um, your file didn't, you didn't submit it with the proper stamp and so on. And so there's a tension there in uh, being a judge in performing this bureaucratic role for the state while also wanting to represent um, God's law. Um, and uh, for those reasons, I think being a judge is, is an uncomfortable position in some ways, although it is also a good, a well rewarded one uh, in others. Um, and that then starts bringing me into the second half of the book, where I think about how all of those tensions um, and frustrations for those working within the state courts, um, that those are not necessarily the same if you're uh, an independent uh, uh, legal scholar. Uh, if you're thinking about the Sharia outside the constraints of the, of the courts. One of the other problems that people identify in the courts, one of the most important ones, is that the vision of Sharia that is applied is in some ways a constrictive one uh, and many would argue an out-of-date one. Because, of course, uh, human interpretations of what the Sharia is can change over time. Um, and many countries in the Middle East um, and elsewhere have reformed their family law, uh, perhaps, for example, making uh, rights between husbands and wives more equal or uh, divorce, changing the way in which that works uh, between men and women or laws of custody and so on. And that process, although there's been much, much uh, demand for it to take place in Lebanon, has has taken place, or it had at the time of my fieldwork anyway, more slowly than elsewhere. Um, and that's most likely because, as I started by saying, these courts are embedded in the political system. So changing anything in the courts becomes a question about how politics works in Lebanon more generally. Outside of the courts, however, you can be as imaginative and as progressive as you like. Um, and what I do in the, in the latter half of the book is I focus especially on the example of one scholar, Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Fadlallah, um, who uh, was uh, a uh, famous leading Shi uh, jurist. Um, he died in 2010, um, just after my field work, sadly, but um, I did manage to um, meet him a number of times, but also uh, uh, do feel like a hang out, as it were, you know, attend uh, the business of his offices. Um, and uh, so that was a, an opportunity I was very grateful for as well, was to be able to see how uh, people uh, reacted with uh, the offices of a leading scholar in this way. So I think a little bit first about uh, how Sayyid Fadlala became such a prominent jurist, his career, and I, and I trace um, the roots again, as we started out with the young sheikh in his earlier career, his engagement with people, his helping people with their problems, um, especially during the Civil War period. Uh, these were things that, um, you know, his followers, his supporters, um, and people more widely uh, mentioned. So this idea again of um, the, the scholar as somebody engaged with people's issues, 
But then I can go on and show how that engagement allowed him to understand people's problems. Uh, he saw himself as a pupil as much as a teacher, he said, so that and then understanding what people's issues were through, for example, the, the questions that they asked um, in Istifta'at, where people are asking questions, uh, wanting to know what the Sharia uh, says about a given issue. Um, he could then understand the sorts of problems that people were facing in the modern world because he thought that uh, Lebanon, because of its plurality with all the different communities, the fact that it was in some sense nearer uh, the West than some of the scholarly centers of the Middle East, uh, where many of the, the Torah Shi scholars live, that meant that he could understand the problems of today uh, in some sense uh, better. And his vision of the law could then change in response. And I show how for uh, a particular issue, uh, which is the age at which uh, girls become legally responsible under Islamic law, so that then once they become an adult, they need to uh, uh, wear modest dress, they need to fast, they need to pray. Um, and he, he said that it became clear to him through the questions that people were asking that they were thinking that the age at which that's normally expected to happen at nine years old um, is too young, that um, these uh, girls in Lebanon at that point, they weren't really ready to take up those kind of responsibilities. Um, and then, you know, through a process of um, legal thinking, he developed arguments um, that would allow that, that thought that that should properly take place later um, when um, they reach puberty. Um, and then you can see how that legal position gradually started emerging uh, in uh, legal publications uh, that he made. And so I talk about this as a process of making law uh, from the bottom up. And so you can see that as a free, as an independent scholar, you can uh, relate to Sharia in a different way, and it can be more flexible, uh, more dynamic. However, then, in terms of whether that kind of, those kind of opinions then become part of the life of the Sharia in the state, in terms of the state courts, that didn't happen um, uh, because of um, local politics, basically. I talk a little bit about the relationship between Sayyid Fadlallah and um, the uh, 12 Ashi uh, establishment uh, in Lebanon. So, um, you know, I then come to the book, uh, come to the end of the book, and I conclude uh, thinking about how there are these tensions. On the one hand, of course, um, it's important uh, for people who are committed to the, to the Sharia, that Sharia be part of the life of the state. Uh, but on the other hand, that then brings its own frustrations, which being free of those uh, constraints uh, liberates you from you, you can um, uh, have a more progressive and dynamic vision of Sharia. Um, so that's what the book's about. But of course, every uh, uh, writer would love their book to be a bestseller um, and reach a very general audience. But um, I think realistically, this is a book for an academic audience. Um, I wanted it because, because there hasn't been a book about um, this subject for Lebanon before. I want it to provide um, sort of basic information about um, how uh, Islamic law relates to state law in Lebanon uh, for, you know, legal professionals uh, and people interested in knowing about and researching uh, Muslim family law. But I wanted it also to reach a, a, a wider audience than that in terms of uh, Islamic legal studies, uh, which is a big subject now, people interested in thinking about the nature of Sharia uh, and its place in the modern world more generally, um, and also for anthropologists of law uh, and uh, people interested in um, the Middle East uh, and, of course, Lebanon. So an academic audience, but several different sorts of um, subject areas. And I hope that that's not just um, sort of professional academic researchers, but of course also uh, students as well.